Today, I'm delighted to welcome Didier Elzinger, CEO at Culture Amp to the Digital HR Leaders podcast. Didier, welcome to the show. I probably, I should actually say, welcome back to the show. Um, can you believe it's been five years since you recorded that ep- episode in the in the Insight Two 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 office in in London in those halcyon pre pandemic days? Um, I know Culture Amp has grown significantly um, over those five years. As you introduce yourself and Culture Amp, please tell us about your growth journey and and what you what you've been up to as a, as a CEO of Culture Amp in the in the past five years. Thanks, David. Yeah, I mean. What are five years to try and recap? I mean, it, it really has been pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, so, yeah, for anyone that uh, I don't know who's listening, um, my name is Didier. I'm the CEO and founder of Culture Amp. And our mission today is the same as it was when we spoke five years ago. It was the same as it was when we started, which is to create a better world of work. And so for us, that's about helping customers drive intentional culture at scale so they can deliver on their mission. That's our mission, and we want to help our customers deliver on theirs. Um, I was thinking actually before this, like where were we when we last spoke? Uh, and I was trying to remember how, I think we had about 1,500, 2,000 customers, something like that at the time. So we're now over 7,000. We're almost 1,000 campers who are building and delivering the, the Culture Amp platform and helping customers grapple with all sorts of questions. And I think what's been so interesting about the last five years, and I'm sure what we're going to spend a lot of today talking about, is just how varied those questions have become now. Like, mm. you know, 10 years ago, everyone was like, you know, are my people engaged? What, what is my culture like? And now we're thinking about how should we approach remote work? How do we define our performance culture? How do we build a development-driven culture? What makes our organizations more inclusive? How do we become more diverse? And so our journey has been a journey with all our customers exploring those questions and then bringing the data to bear either individually or en masse in the research that we do to try and you know, really drive that. So where are we five years later? I would hope to think wiser. Um, I'm not sure we've actually got answers to all the questions yet, though. No, I don't think we'll ever have the answers to some of those questions. I think they, the answers evolve over time as well, don't they? So I think, um, which is why, you know, companies need tools like Culture Amp to help them understand um, those answers and how they're tracking over time as well. So, DA, one of the things that I've always felt when I've interacted with you and, and um campers i'll call them campers the, the, mm-hmm. the people at culture Amp over the years is that there's a very strong culture um and you know it's something that i've i've, I've really seen as i said every you know i think i've been interacting with people at culture Amp now for probably eight eight nine years mm. um what would you given how far culture Amp has has come and you know and certainly if we just look at customer size you you've you've quadrupled in the since we last mm. spoke on 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 the podcast what would you say the one thing that has kept your culture thriving during its growth it's a really interesting question and it reminds me i often get asked like when we get a new intake of um, campers and i'll do a, a q and a or I'll, I'll talk to them and i often get asked the question of what are we going to do to maintain our culture because people come to culture Amp because they see this culture and they want to be part of it and they believe in what we believe in and I always think that's actually the wrong question because the goal shouldn't be to keep what you have. Like, obviously, it's important and it's got you here, but I really think it's about as we continue to grow and as we continue to scale, how might we be even more what we aspire to be? Like, we're not perfect. No organization is. So how as we grow do we keep getting better? And the thing that I'm kind of obsessed with is what is the kernel of that culture? So people will go, oh, you know, I've spoken to all these people at Culture Amp and they come across in a certain way and they're definitely Culture Amp type people. And if you went to anyone at Culture Amp and asked them, uh, you know, what, what makes this place Culture Amp, they could list a whole bunch of things off. But the most important part is, okay, but how does that create value for the customer? Mm-hmm. Like what are those kernels of the culture that create value for the customer? And how do we do more of that? And there's just like a million things that get in the way of it. And so if anything, I think it's just that constantly coming back to, what is it about our culture that actually creates value for customers? And how do we continue to lean into that? And I think obviously being a people-centric and a culture-first organization, the heart of that realization is you've got to create that space for your own people before they can do it for your customers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you practice what you preach effectively. Uh, and if people are passionate about culture uh, and the culture at Culture Amp, then they're more likely to be passionate about helping their, their, their clients um, create the thriving culture as well. Yeah. And, and realizing that it's, like a lot of people sort of talk about, you know, practice what you preach and, you know, live your culture and invest in your people. And that's all easy to say. 
Mm. But it's actually many times those things are hard to do. And so it's when you're wrestling with it going, oh, what do I do here? Like, what's the choice here when both choices have consequences? And that's where the culture is born. And what are some of the things you do to kind of evolve that culture? A culture? I know because obviously you're based in Melbourne, Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's where Culture Am started. But you've got campus in the UK, you've got campus in the mm-hmm. US, I know, and probably in other countries as well. How do you mm-hmm. how do you kind of what are some of the things you do to to keep that culture thriving? So I think it's a mixture. And this is obviously a challenge that all organizations wrestle with when we think about things like diversity and inclusion. So On the one hand, you get really focused on what are the values that underpin your your, your business? Because those values bring people together. Like it doesn't matter who someone is, where they come from, what their background is, what their gender, diversity, whatever. They believe in like our first values have the courage to be vulnerable. So that transcends across all sorts of things. And people come to Coltramp because they believe in that. And they want to be in an organization that puts that to the fore. So you start with your values that brings people together. As my wife, who's um, actually a bit of a specialist in the value space and is doing her own startup on that, a little plug for that, which is the compass.ai, but uh, she says beliefs separate us, but values bring us together. So firstly, you bring people together. But then the second thing is you've got to learn from those people too. Like every time you bring someone Mm -hmm. into the organization, it's an opportunity to bring something you don't have, knowledge you don't have, experience you don't have, insight you don't have. And so it's like balancing those two things of staying core to what it is that started the company, but then actually creating space for those new people to come in and share their stories in a way. And, and actually, that's some of the stuff I'm the most inspired by now. Like when I meet somebody who's joined Coltramp and I hear why they joined and what they want to go do, that creates so much energy and motivation for me. So, so Diddy, if we take some of those learnings and, and apply that to, to other organizations, you know, companies that you work with, maybe other companies as well, particularly given that, you know, pretty much everyone that listens to this uh, podcast is an HR professional looking at, at ways to to um, sustain and improve the culture in their organizations. You know, what are some of the common challenges that uh, organizations face with creating and maintaining a positive and, and thriving company culture? So I think there's ones that we've known about for years and for decades. What I'm really interested in is the things that we've really seen come to the fore in the last few years. So one challenge that a lot of organizations are facing is just the pure economics. Uh, You know, they were in an environment where everything was a war for talent and you couldn't hire fast enough. And now they're in a situation with frozen or declining headcounts. And so that's changing the way they're interacting and talking about people and culture. So that's that's a big challenge. How do we, you know, how do we mount the case for that in that argument, in that world? Um, There's the ever-present conversation of remote versus in-office work. And what does that mean for culture? Are we in all remote? Are we hybrid? Are we in the office? Should we? Shouldn't we be? Who does that reward or or make it easier for and who doesn't it? And I don't know anyone that solved that, but it's, you know, it's ever-present and it it finds its way into everything. Like you think you're talking about one thing and then people are like, oh, that's because people aren't in the office or that's because this, that's because that. And then the other one, which I think is in some ways the hardest, but also the root of a lot of the challenges that we're seeing people face is what I would call a threat-based mindset. And it's this thing that because of all of this pressure, people are right at the end of their tether and they're under a huge amount of pressure. And when we're under a threat-based mindset, we show up in a different way. We're protect what's mine. You know, a profound sense of not enough and a profound sense of like, I've got to protect what's mine. And yet what we're trying to do with our culture and what we're trying to do in our organizations is we over me. We have to help people understand that at the end of the day, we've got to do this together. And so um, the, the challenge I think for a lot of organizations is how to have that conversation. And what's happening is instead of it, everyone having one conversation, we're having two different conversations. So leadership is talking about a sense of entitlement and how they think people just got to suck it up because this is the new world and they should be happy to have a job. And then you've got employees on the other side feeling a profound sense of betrayal because they're like, I don't think I'm being treated like a person anymore. I'm just a number. And that I think is the heart of most of the challenges for most companies right now. So how how do we get out of that? I mean, I, I I mean, we're going to talk about the economic volatility piece in 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 a depth a minute because I know Culture Amp's been doing some research in that particular area. Those two areas, though, how this remote versus in office? How do we get away from num- the conversation being the number of days people spend in the office and actually start talking about the work and 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 how it gets done and and how 
culture can thrive in in many different um setups of of, of of teams and maybe it's best to leave it to the team i don't know i would be interested in what your research um shows and your data shows around that did yeah well and i think that's actually one of the good things at the moment is that we asked a whole bunch of questions that we didn't have answers to but slowly over time we're actually starting to get more data and so we're actually able to see well what difference does it make and does that hold or does it not hold um I think the first thing that people have to do is get away from this idea of, which is actually a pre, pre-COVID pre issue, of this dichotomy that either you work from the office or you work from home, or you're a remote worker or you're an in-office worker. I think what we've learned now is that we're all of the above, just at different times. And what that means is when you accept that, you then have to think about work in a more fluid way. And it also potentially creates the opportunity for us to change some of the traditional ideas. So I think pre-COVID, we thought about the office as a place where we would come together to work. But if we wanted to create or collaborate, we would go off-site because you couldn't really do that on-site. And the truth of it is for a lot of people these days, if all you're doing is answering emails and doing Zoom calls and, and so on, not for everyone because not everybody has space at home, but for those that do, it may be more productive to do that at home without the commute. But if you want to create and collaborate, come into the office. That's a place where we can do that. So if we're going to do that, we're going to redefine and redesign the way our offices work. And so I think that's where the interesting stuff is happening, where people are sort of taking some stuff that's been away for a long time and saying, what if it's not like that? What if we think of a new fluid space? And that stuff I think is actually really exciting. What happens if we redesign our offices not to be a place that people are chained to? So we we have an acronym, which is um, FOMO over Roby. And so what we mean by that is you want to create a culture of a fear of missing out, which is why you go into the organization, not a requirement of being in. Like you want to see the pictures of people having lunch together at work or of seeing somebody they haven't seen for a while. That's why you go in. Not because somebody said it's important for your development for you to be in the office five days a week. Yeah. And that probably lends to the second one, this the threat based mindset where you've got um, not in most companies, actually, it's more like outliers, but these are the ones that are reported. Leaders insisting that people are in the office five days a week, which is ridiculous. They weren't in the office five days a week before COVID in most yeah. cases. And you've got employees who want that flexibility. As you said, you know, I've got a day of of, of Zoom calls and I've got a day of um, responding to email. Well, I'm going to be far more productive doing that at home. And actually, the company is going to get more hours out of me because I'm not commuting there and there and back as yeah. well. Um, and I'm not annoying my my colleagues by just sitting in a corner and not talking to anyone because I'm trying to get get all my work done. Um, versus, you know, actually, I'm going to go into the office today. I'm kicking off a project with three or four of the of the team, and we need to come together to 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 innovate and to, to to try and germinate some ideas. You know, and I think that flexibility in some organisations is is almost being taken away, isn't it? It is, and it's not. Once again, I think we're going to get out of these dichotomies because sometimes people kind of go, it's either all the employees' fault mm. because they're not doing it, or it's all the mm. leaders' fault. And the truth is both are happening. Like you're having very inflexible leaders, but you're also having employees that are like, it's me over we. Like, well, I don't want to come in today, so why should I come in today? You're like, because everybody else in the team is coming in and that's how we work together. <laughs> so there is extremities on both sides. And... I'm, I'm an optimist. So what I see that I think is good is that we've now done it for long enough that people have started to appreciate this value in different areas. There are people like, I actually like being able to work from home two days a week, but I really love coming into the office as well. So can we please have a way to do both? Yeah, and I guess we'll see that there'll be more and more data that comes and, and we'll start to see even more sort of patterns and and maybe guidance. I mean, you know, not every company is the same, of course, so you can learn, but you can learn from others, particularly. I know what you do at Culture, you mm. look at, all the data that you're collecting from all the different organizations that you're working with and you start to see some themes and some patterns in there don't you yeah and that's our like that's one of my favorite uh, lines that we use at culture app which is that your culture is unique but your problems are not mm. so <laughs> there's a lot we can learn from the challenges that other people are facing too yeah so let's, let's move on to the first one that you mentioned which is a kind of the the economics and, mm. and, the, and the volatility that we've seen you know over the last, I would say probably since the start of the pandemic, because obviously that created some volatility in itself. It's a major concern for organisations. As, as you said, there's much more focus now on, on developing the talent that you've got rather than continue going out and hiring, which is interesting. We're seeing lots of things around internal mobility around that. Um, but we're seeing more organisational restructures. We're seeing downsizing. 
And I know that Culture Amps recently published um, research on the on the effects of layoffs on employee engagement over a four year period. So I'm really mm. interested to dig into that. Uh, one of the most compelling insights um, that resonated with me was the, the contrast in engagement recovery times following layoffs during the COVID-19 pandemic compared to those that were initiated in, in 2023. Um, and I think that this, uh, the period required for employee engagement to rebound after pandemic related layoffs was significantly shorter at 12 to 18 months than the recovery time that you observed last year for layoffs, which was 18 to 24 months. So I'd be interested. Tell us a little bit more about this research, Didier, but maybe start with why you think that is. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, I'll, I'll hold on the why I think it is. Okay. I'll just talk a little bit about the, the research because it's been obviously a massive shift and you've seen it happen all over the world. So that's been scary for a lot of people involved. As a, you know, when you approach it as a social scientist, you're like, it's also a great opportunity to learn. And so we've been looking at it. And one of the things that I myself am always interested in is there's a lot of narrative around layoffs, particularly at the senior leadership level, that is all of the kind of, well, you know, that's just what, you know, great leaders make tough calls. And actually, most of these businesses are better off on the other side because they're trimmer and meaner and they've got, you know, increased their talent density. And yes, it was hard, but it was the right thing to do. And actually, you'll be happy you did it. And that's never really stuck with me I've, I've always found that quite objectionable like when you sit around the board table and somebody says look you know this is just what we have to do and, and actually most people will be happy when you do it they won't and they don't you know the truth of it is sometimes you have to do it and then you do it and you do it to survive but mm. enough of this false bravado and so one of the things that was really important for us was looking in the data and go well what actually does happen like are there business consequences because everyone just looks at the bottom line and goes well you know you're more efficient now so you should be better and what our data showed was that there are, there are very long consequences. And now that we've had these multiple rounds, what we're seeing, and you just mentioned at the beginning, is on the second rounds of layoffs, 18 months later, people have still only recovered to what they got to six months, in six months the first time. Now, why? Why, I think, is it comes back to, I used the word earlier, betrayal doesn't matter which way you dress it up. doesn't matter if it's the right thing to do from the business point of view. I hope it is. It's still an act of betrayal for, for the employees. And the one, even the ones that are left, like survivorship guilt is, is real. So people are sitting there going, well, you know, two people I know really well got laid off and I didn't, and I don't really know how to feel about that. And it creates a lot of challenges. And then they look forward and they go, well, next time what the, the decision might be. So it's, it's like anything. You injure yourself once and you recover, you're okay. You injure yourself again, you're gonna take longer to recover because your body's not fully healed. And I think that's what we're seeing. And I think it's an important um, counterpoint to the language that goes around at the moment because the language that you hear at the moment is from people who are basically doing cognitive dissonance. We had to make a terrible choice, we made a terrible choice, and actually we're, we're okay. You know, probably not as okay as you think you are. Mm. And it'd be interesting that more of this type of research that as it comes out and people start to see that there are longer term, medium term impacts, not just on people within the organisation, but presumably on on business performance as well. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe there's more research that needs to be done on that. Um, then maybe that will make companies think a little bit differently about these layoffs. Because, I mean, we see and again, it's in the press, so I always take it with a pinch of salt. You see companies making announcements about layoffs and suddenly their share price goes through the roof. Yeah. Um, and you wonder whether that's what, you know, but on the betrayal side, you wonder if that's why some companies are making those decisions, which doesn't seem ethical to me. Well, and it is. And I mean, it's also because there's a constant flow of capital in different ways. And in up markets, the companies are, hold the, you know, the whip hand and so they can reward people and in down markets, they don't mm. and they, they struggle. And so I think it's, it's a fascinating push-pull. But you, as you said, you can see the business consequences of it. And I think what it exposes when you really dig into it and people are like, well, yes, but we finally were able to make some of the changes we should have made years ago. And the real takeaway from this is, yeah, you should have made the changes years ago. Like, you needed to restructure that department. Okay, well, you should have actually addressed that rather than going every year, we're just going to drop 10%. Because that's a really crude way of doing organizational change <laughs> yeah and one that has consequences which is what the data shows mm. yeah it's it's it's, it's and that's one of the great things about the access the access to data and particularly 
we think about some of the stuff that the culture ramps doing you know probably when you started the organization you're working with companies that were maybe doing an annual survey maybe some of them are doing mm. a biannual survey doing it once every two years whereas now people are um that they're, they're going out and listening to the organization on a more continuous basis some some are doing it daily some are doing it weekly some are doing it monthly um some are still doing it annually um, and obviously, we can now not just look at some of the scale questions, we can look at some of the text um, comments as well. So I think we, is it true to say that, you know, if you think about the evolution of Coltram over the years, you're getting deeper insights now um, from from the work that you're doing from the platform, which really supports your your, your clients to, to really understand how, how employees are feeling and then actually take action on some of those, the appropriate action on some of those things as well. Yeah, because it, you, it allows you to, go beyond just the average and look into the details you're saying it's it's temporal so we can look at it and go how's that changing month on month or quarter on quarter but also across different areas so you might look at it and go actually the the customer facing the sales side of the organization rebuilt re, you know rebounded quite quickly but in engineering we've got a much longer term issue that we have to deal with and those are things that weren't always there before for people to you know see what they needed to do with so yeah you're right like much more fine grained data and then you know, I'll probably talk more about this as we keep going. The challenge for most people is not that they don't have enough data. <laughs> they have more than enough data, as you well know. And the question is, what am I going to do mm -hmm. with it? Like, and how can I make sense of what I'm seeing? And that's where the, you know, the concept of you want to be able to see your own data and then you also want to see what's going on elsewhere. And so like when we share out the, the layoff data that we share, when people have to go through that process, it allows them to go, okay, we now know that engagement is going to come down. And then we expect engagement to come back slowly. Mm -hmm. And so then if they're doing really good work and really leaning into the things that can help rebuild morale on the other side of layoff, then they can actually go, hey, engagement is still lower than it was. But if we're tracking ourselves against what everybody else is doing, we can actually see the progress we're making. Yeah. And that's super important when it comes back to getting leaders to continue to do the things. You need to validate what they're doing as being worthwhile. And actually, I think as an example of that, one of the insights um, in the research you've done at Coltramp was around the resilience of employee engagements in, in certain regions, such as the UK, where mm. I am, uh, and Germany. Mm -hmm. I, I just wonder, mm. what are the key factors do you believe contribute to this resilience? Is it what you say? Is it companies being a little bit more intentional, a bit more mindful about it? Or is it something unique in, the, in those markets? The first thing is, I don't know. Um, it's a hot topic internally. <laughs> We're trying to figure this out too. We have some theories and I'll share, your, I'll share our theories. Um, the first theory is a little bit what you just talked about intentionality. If you look at the regulatory regimes in places like Germany and the UK versus say the US, there are a lot more employee protections. And so one, one reasonable theory is that even though layoffs are still happening everywhere, those layoffs are less of a betrayal in that place because at least people are looked after in a better way. And even the consultation process is longer Whereas in the US, it's not uncommon for, you know, the CEO to send out the announcement and people to be gone before they get back to their desks. And so you can see a bigger gap. The, the other thing that's quite interesting is that the UK and Germany were less engaged to begin with. And so one of the things you see is the higher the score, the further it falls. <laughs> and when we did our first round of layoff data, that's one of the things we showed, which was that the companies that had highly engaged workforces actually had some of the biggest drops after layoffs. Not surprisingly, because people are like, hey, I thought you cared. Um, if you're in an organization where you're like, well, I'm not sure you cared anyway, this just proves that you don't care. <laughs> the actual change, the numbers don't change much. So maybe there's a little bit of the, uh, you know, stiff upper lip that uh, <laughs> the British are famous for. <laughs> Or the cynicism, perhaps, yeah. um, if, we, if, we put, if we put it from another point. But yeah, I mean, and again, I guess it's interesting. It's interesting you say that, you know, the, A, the protections that employees get in the UK and Germany relative to, to the US and some other markets. Um, you know, and, and maybe, as you said, it's the fact that we're maybe a bit more cynical in the UK, maybe in Germany as well, yeah. um, than, with, than other markets. And, and maybe it's interesting, interesting maybe the labour markets in the, the UK and Germany. I mean, I know that the demand for talent. You know, there, there's, there's jobs that people can't fill in the UK. Mm. Um, so maybe maybe by having a longer consultation period, maybe by providing a softer landing for those that are affected by by layoffs and maybe, you know, actually good offboarding, help actually giving people access to um, potential other opportunities 
you know, is 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 helpful because at least people feel okay. That wasn't a great experience. I was let go, but at least you know I, I'm I'm okay. I've got time to find my next role, or I've even been given advice around what my next role could be. I I don't know. I mean, again, it's I guess these are all hypotheses. Well, and it goes back to that survivorship bias. People want to see that people have been looked after. Like it's important to them. I mean, all this really just goes to show Didier how important the culture is, especially in turbulent times. Um, you know, proving to C-suite can often be a challenge for HR leaders. Um, as you're well aware, the board's main focus is usually around improving the the bottom line, and it can be often be difficult to quantify the financial impact of of your company culture. I'd love to love to hear your thoughts on this as a CEO and obviously of a of a CEO of a, of a company that helps companies improve culture. How and that, and then also maybe as part of that, how can chief people officers and other HR leaders get CEOs and the board on side uh, when it comes to culture? Mm. I mean, these are these are my favourite questions. Um, Good. <laughs> I think the first thing, so as a CEO, I get frustrated at times because people are like, oh, you know, we need to create a ROI business case for this. And then the CEO will be forced to approve it. And, you know, when you're a leader, you get positive ROI business cases all day, every day, but you can't fund them all. Otherwise you run out of money. And you also develop a fair amount of healthy cynicism about most of those models too. So somebody comes and goes, look, I can make $3 million for the business. And you're like, mm, yeah, okay, maybe. So I think the first thing is to not temper expectations, but to focus them the right way. And so one of the challenges that I think I see often on the PNC side or people culture side is that we're too focused on, we need to prove empirically that there's a five times return on this project for the bottom line. And I'm like, that will probably get laughed out of the room. If the leadership fundamentally doesn't believe that culture matters, no amount of spreadsheets or business models or anything are going to prove it to them. Most leaders do believe in culture. Most leaders know that culture is the heart of their business, but the problem is they have no idea how to wrap their arms around it and they have no way to size it. So I think the real thing is what you want to do is not prove that culture has an ROI, but show how it has an ROI and help people understand the return. And you know, we did some work with Forrester and there's a report that they've just put out where they went and interviewed a bunch of um, companies using CultureAmp and created a composite company, you know, sort of you know, decent sized 3000 people, 500 million revenue business. And they looked at, well, what are the benefits that it creates? And of course there's lots of nice ROI numbers in there where it's like, this generates, um, you know, 300% ROI on the project. But what I like about that and what I take away from it is it helps people understand the quantum of the problem that you're solving. It allows you as, as a people leader to go, hey, at the moment, we just have our data everywhere and we use anecdotal information to drive our people decisions. We want to put in a structured listening tool like CultureAmp because we want to drive employee engagement. And we know that if we do that, we can improve our attrition. And a good leader then will go, oh, okay, like what's that going to cost us? Okay, it'll cost us this amount of money. And what benefit do we get for that? Well, this is a multi-million dollar problem. It's not a $10,000 problem. It's not a $100,000 problem. It's a two, $3 million problem. And that's what we're playing with. And that's the conversation that you want to start having with people. So it's how do we use data? How do we bring it to bear? So you can use something like the Forrester report that at least you know, shows somebody that might be skeptical. Look, other companies have actually generated these savings. And you can usually do that through um, looking at attrition is, is an easy way to... Um, empirically determine what the, what the results might be. But it goes much deeper than that too, because it's management productivity, it's engagement and the relationship it has to the results you have for your customers. So you can sort of show that at the macro level, but then at the micro level, you want to be able to turn that into the organizational context and say, this is the investment I want to make. This is the size of the return that I think we can, we can do. And what's so good with all the extra tools that we have now, like through a platform like Coltramp, is that you can also bring um, data to bear in different ways. So if you think about what's the gold standard of doing um, sort of data research is you do split tests and you show what happens when you have a control group. So rather than coming to me and saying, here's a paper from somebody out in the world that says that we get a three times return for investment in coaching, come to me and say, uh, the ten, I, I scrimped 10 grand out of my own budget and invested it in a coaching program for a cohort of leaders. And I want to show you the data from what happened. 
Here are the leaders that I put through my coaching program. Here are the leaders that didn't go through the coaching program. Here's the 10 percentage point increase in engagement in the, um, in the leaders that were coached. I would like another $100,000 so I can roll that program out across the rest of the company. Like you've A-B tested it for me, you've shown me the return, you've shown me you can implement it, and you've given me an opportunity to invest in your idea. And so I think that's the core of what we need to get better at doing. And the great thing is we have all these tools now to help us underpin that. And you won't always know what the answer is going to be. Like you, most leaders don't know what the return on investment is on their training, but they can. Yeah, and, and that's, I think you highlighted a really important point, Didier, that maybe we need to get better at in HR. And I think it has been happening. Mm -hmm experimentation mm -hmm. you know test things as you said a b test it so you've got a control group you've got a group that have been effectively been treated with the um the leadership development in in this example and actually show what the difference is because you know if it mirrors what what the what we're seeing in academia or what we're seeing in other studies by the likes of Forrester and other analysts then then surely that presents quite a compelling story for for any leader or ceo that then thinks okay i want to actually invest some of some of what I can invest in in that, and then let's see if we can if we can multiply that across the across the organisation or in one part of the organisation first, perhaps. So yeah, I think it's a it's a, that experimentation, and I guess with people analytics teams, you know, platforms like Culture Amp uh, and and others in that way, and and maybe more behavioural scientists coming into 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 the HR space, we can actually start to set up these experiments, um, you know, and 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 learn from them. Yeah, and I think you know if I can offer the, the listener a, 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 a trick, if you will, um, it's always tempting to try and make things look more impressive, but that's often less believable. So, for example, when Forrester did this work with us and they modelled the returns and, and the you know the value, one of the things you're looking there is the cost of replacing an employee. Now, you and I would know, and many of the people on the call would know that the sort of in the industry, most people would use somewhere from one to one and a half times someone's annual salary as the true cost of replacing them. What Forrester did is they went, yep, that's fine, but we're going to use 20% of their cost as the replacement cost because that's like just a like true out the door money spent. You cannot argue with that number. And so when somebody comes to me and says, this is going to save us 300,000, I'm like, oh, how did you work that out? And you're like, well, a lot of people would quantify it like this, but we're just using this much smaller version of it because we want to make sure this is almost a risk free. Like, okay, now I'm listening to you because you actually know what you're doing. Like you're not just taking the two biggest numbers you can get, putting them together and then trying to impress me with the fact that you're going to save me a million dollars. I'd much prefer a well thought through plan to save a hundred than a pie in the sky one to save a million. Yeah, I mean, again, if you can show with fairly conservative figures that you're still going to have a big return, then as you said, that's going to that's going to have an impact. Taking away the risk. Yeah. Um, and actually, for those HR leaders listening and, and thinking, you know, putting together a business case, it's a bit of a bit of a challenge. It's not something I've got a huge amount of experience in. Um, and maybe when they're thinking about how to measure a potential ROI of their investments, do you have it? Do you have any advice on how to do this? Is it a case of maybe partnering better with finance, for example? Yeah, I mean, finance is always uh, a great partner for this. They love doing it. Um, they have, you know, they do this all day, every day. They have good instincts for what's a good threshold. What should we be accepting? What shouldn't we be accepting? The the thing, the thing I would offer people is, oftentimes we get stuck in these things trying to figure out what might happen, and or what will happen if we do this thing, where I would often start is, what's the cost of doing nothing? So how does the data, what is the data that we already have? What, and just project that forward. So that you're not walking in saying, I need you to spend this money to do something. What you're doing is you're walking in and going, given all the data we know, this is what is gonna happen. So if we look at our retention insights in our engagement survey, and we know that no one in that area intends to be here for two years from now, then you know they're all gonna leave and you're gonna to have to replace them. And it's much more powerful to sit down and say to somebody, if we do nothing, this is what the future is gonna look like. Are you happy with that? And the leader will probably say no. And you're like, okay, well, I'm glad you said that because here are three alternatives for how we can avoid this. <laughs> so finance is super important, but also, you know, it's all storytelling. Yeah, I was just about to say, it's, 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 it's all storytelling. It's all about getting people's attention. Mm. Um, and getting them to getting them on not on sides, but getting them to to recognise that there's a problem that needs to be solved. Yes, uh, and, and and that doing nothing is a very deliberate choice that has consequences. Exactly. No, no, very good. Um, 
So D Didier, before before we head to the the question of the series, I'm I'm curious. What excites you about the future of work, if that's not a nebulous term? Um, and do you do you foresee any trends that will change how we, we view workplace culture? Maybe if we were doing this interview in three or four years' time, for example. So, I mean, we've already talked about a lot of the stuff that's going on in the world, you know, remote work and hybrid work and, you know, all of these challenges. I think the thing that I'm excited about, particularly if we think about just the rise of AI and the, the role that it's playing in everything, is it sort of forces us to really think about what does it mean to be human at work? And like, why is that important? And how does that create value? And I think for a long time, from a management and leadership point of view, and, and even to a lesser degree from a HR point of view, we were the complete end of the spectrum. It was all about how do we kind of remove the human how do we systematize everything, processize everything? Like if you can systematize it, you can probably automate it, which probably means it's gonna be done by AI. So where do we need humans? And how do we engage them and embrace them and lift that up? And whilst it's somewhat terrifying, it's also really exciting to think about what work might look like with human truly at the center and being the thing that we're you know, building our organizations around. Yeah, and I think from, you know, listening to what you say there I mean and again listening to many people in our in our space I think what we're talking about here is augmentation mm -hmm. not automation yes automization of maybe some of the more um onerous tasks or, or not onerous tasks but easy tasks re repetitive tasks and then actually hopefully freeing people up whether they're workers whether they're HR professionals frankly to do more interesting work where the human element is 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 paramount yeah yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you read a lot of sci-fi, they always talk about this thing of like the real power of technology is simulation. So before you go into the actual thing, we can run it a thousand times and go, what's likely to happen? And simulation doesn't tell you what to do. It just gives you a sense of probability. And I'm excited by that idea of what we can do in work with those tools around us. So in a way, it's bringing your old, your old world yes. back of working in film back into, uh, into the people space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. And any sort of concerns about the future, about about AI and, and you know, what do we need to be careful about, um, particularly as we apply these types of tools in the workplace? Oh, I mean, I think when we spoke five years ago, I remember we were talking about the ethics around you know, statistical learning and how people use that data and the conclusions and inferences that they draw from data. And so I think that's only going to become even more so. And It's, you know, AI, technology, all these things are amplifiers and reinforcers. So they will keep extending us in the direction we're already going. And we've seen this in a lot of the conversations of the, the data sets that these things are trained on. The answers will only be as good as the data sets that we have. If the data sets are biased, which they all are, then we will get biased outcomes. And so it's itself not going to improve. And so I think that's going to be, that's going to require some really interesting work to be done for us to figure out how to keep all of this power, but not have it go the wrong way and reinforce the very system that we're trying to fix in the first place. Yeah, it's pretty back to what you said a, a little bit earlier around, you know, experimentation a little bit, you know, doing some control pilots and just seeing what the outcomes, positive and negative are. And Yeah, and, and I think there's been some good stuff um, Actually, so Alexis Fink posted something the other day and on just the, the ethics of people analytics and reminding us all that the, the questions we're asking and the answers we're giving are really important ones to, to individuals and to organizations. And so we owe a high duty of care. Like if all you're trying to do is figure out where to put a button on a web page to maximize the traffic, I mean, it's not all, but like if that's what you're doing, it doesn't matter how you get the right answer because you know you're validated with it but if we're trying to decide whether we hire this person or that person there's real consequences to that choice and so we should require a lot of thinking into the algorithms and the approaches that are used to make that call yeah i remember actually probably five years ago we probably talked about ethics as it relates to people analytics and i know at the time we were working with some of the companies we worked with at insight 222 on developing an ethics charter 
uh, to govern the use of people data. And obviously they would then take that and iterate that within their own organizations in their own language. It's almost those things are living documents. They have to be continually updated as technology improves and, and, and clearly AI uh, uh, and machine learning and, and, and some of the other stuff that we're, we're seeing, you know, they need to be incorporated into that. And, and I guess, but some of the things that we talked about then, you know, being transparent with employees, what data you're collecting, what you're using it for, what the benefit is for the organization, what the benefit is to them, um, you know, and, and, and actually, you know, being transparent, I think it's, it's important, isn't it? Because it's back to what you were saying. It's about the trust element of this. Without transparency, you, it's going to be difficult to get trust. Yeah. And I mean, one of the the CEOs of one of the AI companies, I was at an event and he, he made a really interesting comment where he said he believes that one of the most important rights that we need to enshrine in the AI world is the right to know whether you're talking to a human or a computer. Mm. Yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a good one. Because we're all already at the point where you're not going to be able to determine that on your yeah. own. Yeah, I mean, I could have Didier Bot um, on the podcast and I wouldn't know, yeah. would I? Well, I, mean, I don't know if you've played with any of those things where you just take footage, two minutes of video, and I just write the text and I'm, it's me talking on screen. I know. It's incredible. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm. And it has powerful uses too. Like I saw, um, I can't remember which company it was. Maybe it was w, one of the large ad agencies, I think. Anyway, one of the large companies, the CEO sent a personalized video to every person in the company thanking them for the work that they'd done the year before. Now, of course, it's using AI, but still, like, that's really interesting. That is interesting. And there's a little off topic for today, but one of the things when I think about AI, I think the mistake people make is they keep going, how do we use AI to solve our biggest problem right now? And that's interesting. But I think the real value that I've seen unlocked in so much of AI is where you can now do stuff that used to be like medium cost, medium return. And those projects that are medium cost, medium return never get done in an organization. You only do the low cost, high return, or sometimes the high cost, high return, but that stuff gets killed. But if you can make that low cost, medium return, you can unlock a huge amount of value. So would you ever actually have the CEO do a recorded video to every person in the company? No. Is it the most valuable thing that you possibly do? Probably not. But it's actually quite powerful. And if you can do it relatively easily, that opens up a whole bunch of new ways of thinking. So that's going to be the challenge and the opportunity for everyone in the people and culture space is how does AI unlock stuff that you don't do today because it's too expensive, either because of time or, or, or whatever else? And what might that unlock? <laughs> rather than how do we use it to solve a really hard problem like should we promote this person or should we hire that person and if you think um no cost medium return if you multiply all those or add all those together then suddenly it becomes you know <laughs> quite high return if you add them all together so yeah very interesting and to didier just penultimate question talk to us a little bit about culture amp is there anything we should be keeping our eyes open for around uh developments that you've got coming up yeah, well, I mean, we just was it last week, I think it was last week, time's a blur at the moment, just announced uh, our first external advisor in Esther Perel. And so been talking to her a little over five years as well, but like super excited to have her on board, um, partly because she's just the most incredibly wise woman. Like I love talking to her and her ability to take complex ideas and, and render them in, in useful ways. But also for us, it really speaks to this idea of, we obviously have a strong IO psychology background, but psychology comes from all these different disciplines. And I love the fact that, you know, she's a psychotherapist who's coming at it from, you know, a relation, the relationship side. But at the end of the day, what is work other than relationships? And so we're really excited about, you know, what she can bring, what her audience can bring, what we can our audience to her. So that type of thought leadership is something that it's exciting to share with the world. And, and certainly there'll be more of it. And then if I think about what we're doing with the product and where we see the space going, um, there's a lot of focus at the moment on consolidation. So there's a lot of companies going, we're going to build a HRS, we're going to be an ATS, we're going to do whatever because it's getting harder and harder to stay where we are. Um, and whilst I understand all of that, that's not really what we're interested in. Like we started life helping people do organizational feedback. So helping understand hundreds or thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of people. And then we extended into individual feedback and really thinking about what are the conversations that need to occur at every level of the company. So it could be performance reviews, could be development conversations, could be one-on-ones. What are the conversations that drive performance in organizations? And now what we're finding when we're working with our customers and going back to what we were talking about earlier is they, 
for all the richness in the data that we have, and I think Culturam has probably some of the richest intent data that we have, there is data we don't have that needs to be brought to bear to help the organization to solve its questions and its problems. So how do we bring that data together in uh, an opinionated way, in a thoughtful way, in a way that allows customers to make, to answer the questions that they need to answer. And so like one of my favorite things at the moment is to go to a company and talk to them and say, who are your best leaders? If you look over the last five or 10 years, who are the best leaders you've ever had? Why and what data underpins that? The truth of it is no one has access to that data because you need pre-hire data, you need post-hire data, you need operating data, you need engagement data, and you need to be able to draw a line through all of that so that you can learn from it. And that's a problem we're really interested in solving. Well, it sounds fascinating. Um, and, and Esther Perel, that's a, that's a real coup. I mean, I think I've seen so many, con I've been so many conferences over the years, but I always remember one of the speeches she gave at Unleash um, in, in, I can't remember if it was in Amsterdam or Paris now, but she literally had the audience eating out of her hand. Um, and you're right, you know, that, that her expertise around relationships is so important in the workplace. It's, it's all about relationships, isn't it? You know, at the end of the day. So uh, really good. So that's what we want to do is go full circle, gather all that data, bring it all together. But at the end of the day, it comes back into a human conversation. So how do we bring AI? How do we bring everything else to our customers so that they can actually have those human conversations? Really good. Well, I think that takes us nicely to um, the question of the series. So this is the question we're asking everyone on this series, Didier. And you might be summarizing some of the stuff that you've already said uh, uh, around this. What are your top three ways that, and don't have to restrict yourself to three, by the way, what are your top three ways that HR can play a pivotal role in creating a thriving organizational culture? <sighs> so I think the first one we kind of just hit on at the end, which is, you know, bring data to bear and help bring that data to answer important questions. So I just shared the question, which I think a lot about, which is like, who are your best leaders? And how do we accelerate that? Like in some ways, if you think about leadership and great leaders and the value they have in organizations, without, if you had no HR, none at all, somebody starts as a first time being manager. And then over a period of time, as long as they're surrounded by some other good managers, they'll eventually get better. And it might take 10, 15, 20 years for them to be able to create real value as a leader. As a people and culture team, how do we accelerate that? How do we make that three years or five years? So in our organization, people accelerate through that learning and through that process. That's a lot of the, the leverage that we bring to the org. So that's one thing. Um, I think in terms of that, like bringing data to bear, we've been doing quite a bit of work around like what board reports can and should look like for the people and culture area. And the key insight there is, and you know, we, we can share like, here's what you should present and here's what the data should be and all that sort of stuff. But the core thing is to help um, like the chief people officer, for example, move away from here's what's happening in the people side. Here's the programs we're rolling out. Here's the things that we're doing. Here's the things that have been done. Here's our engagement survey, etc. And instead look at it going, board reports are a lens on the performance of the company. And people and culture is the most important lens that they should have and very few companies have it. So they get to see the financial performance of every part of their business they might get to see the customer performance of every part of their business, but they don't get to see the people and culture performance. So it's not PNC's deck, it's the organization's decks through a people and culture lens. And you're giving them something that they really, really want. And so I think that's the second part is like that conversation, whether it's at the executive team or at the board level, how do you help the organization understand itself through a people and culture lens, not your area and your programs? And then my last, to stick to the three, would be my advice, I guess, is the scarcest resource that organizations have is not money, it's not time, it's the attention of their leaders and managers. So when we are thinking about those programs that we wanna roll out, how are we thinking about that resource? And how are we thinking about what we're prioritizing to put that resource in front of? And too often I see the conversation being, the poor head of people has to go to the other execs and say, I need you to tell your people that they have to do this thing because it's really important. Like that is a losing battle. Instead, we have to sit down and go, like we actually did this internally where we looked at it and we said at each level of leadership, how do we hope that they are spending their time? 
Like how much of their time do we want them to be spending having one-on-one -on -one conversations with their team? How much time do we want them to be spending on their time thinking about development plans or whatever it might be? And that's different at different levels. But if we can pre-plan that, then we can actually make that more effective. So it's that whole idea of how do we train the attention of the organization not to do all the things we want to do, but to do the most important things. Now, I really like those three. It's almost like how do we in inspire and influence key stakeholders within the organizations to, to really realize the impact um, of... You know, that they could be having. Mm, that they could be having. No, really good. Didier, really enjoyed the conversation. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I know it's, it's, it's coming up quite late in, in, in Melbourne. Before we part ways, could you let listeners know how they can follow you and, and all the work that you and uh, your team at Culture Ramp are doing? Yeah, absolutely. We love community. So, I mean, you can go to the website, cultureamp.com and find everything there, but join the Slack channel, listen to the podcast, the Culture First podcast. If you, Esther Perel is our highest ever rated show. It's a good one to start with. Um, and also the Culture First chapters we have. So these are self-organizing groups. There's over a hundred of them around the world where probably in a city that you're in, you can go join a Culture First chapter. So any one of those, you will find a community of people like you that care about this problem and want to create a better world of work. So follow us on LinkedIn, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, everything. But most importantly, talk to the humans. Oh, well, I think that's a great way to end our conversation, Didier, today. Talk to the humans like that. Thank you very much for being on the show. <laughs> Thank you, David. And hopefully uh, only be a year next time, not five. Let's make it not five till we speak again. Let's not make it five, no. No, no. And I may, I think I may be seeing you in a few weeks, actually, in London. Um, oh, good. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So I look forward to that. And until then, take care, Didier. In this series, we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven and digital HR agenda. Make sure that you subscribe by your podcast app of choice and also via our YouTube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital HR leaders of the future.